welcome colleagues to the second regional universities networking webinar. I am Sherry Ann Farquharson, knowledge management and capacity development expert with the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, SECRE. Before we get started, just want to pause to acknowledge our solidarity with our colleagues and friends in the islands being affected by the eruption of the La Cifre volcano, uh, particularly St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, and St. Lucia. May we find strength and perseverance as we chart the way forward together. The Regional Universities Network is a network of excellence for sustainable energy research and education. The network aims to enhance the knowledge and capacity that's required to support the innovation within the energy sector throughout the region. Participants in the region jointly define and share curricula and programs, collaboratively develop agenda and projects for basic and applied research, and develop or support the development of policies and good practices related to the energy sector. Throughout the collaborative framework established, the network will more effectively leverage grants and other resources that are earmarked for supporting sustainable energy actions within the region. This afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're joining us from, um, I want to introduce to you a new member of the team, the coordinating team for the run. That's Ms. Sorry, that's Dr. Angelica Namdar. She's a spatial and urban planner, and she joins us from the Anton de Kamm University of Suriname as the director of faculty of technology and a senior lecturer there. In particular, she is the coordinator for the MSc in Renewable Energy Technology that's been developed for both Guyana and Suriname. But I'm going to invite Angelica to tell you a little bit more about her role with the ROC. Angelica? Thank you for the introduction, Sherian. Good morning, everyone. As Sharon already announced, I'm, the appoint I'm appointed as the new RON coordinator since shortly. Um, as we all know, there's a lot going on in the region and especially at our universities, but there is also still a lot that we want to do together or things in which we want to bring structure or in detail. So actually, I will focus on getting those things that we still need to do or want to do which we agree on to get those things done. Um, the steering committee has already listed the most important teams and subjects, and we already have a work plan for the coming year. And at this moment, I'm in the phase of setting all the details of the work plan. So very soon, I will get in touch with different stakeholders, with some, maybe more than with others, but I'm looking forward to get a constructive and fruitful cooperation with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. I really appreciate having you on board. Today, our main presentation is from Dr. Legina Henry, an MIT and UE St. Augustine alum, who is now a lecturer of renewable energy at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. Dr. Henry's presentation today is entitled Sargassum Seaweed, a source of transportation fuel for Barbados. Here are a few housekeeping matters just to remind you before she begins. We ask that you keep your videos off to preserve bandwidth unless you're asking a question or making a comment. Also keep your mics muted. Use the raise hand feature if you have a question or comment and wait to be acknowledged before unmuting and speaking. You may also engage with us via the chat throughout the session if you want to do that, if you don't want to speak necessarily. And with all of that behind us, we can now get to the meat of the matter and I hand over to Lejeno. All right, thank, thank you, Sharianne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
And like Sherry Ann said, welcome to this um, webinar of the RUN Regional Universities Network. Um, I am the lecturer for renewable energy in the Renewable Energy Development Lab at the University of the West Indies in Cape Hill, Barbados. Um, and uh, uh, just to echo how we started the meeting, I wanted us to begin in a, with a moment of reflection on this, where we are, what's going on in our region right now. Um, thoughts, all of our thoughts are with St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and um, we too in Barbados experience a lot of the um, ash fall from um, this eruption of last of free air volcano. So we look around Barbados, we look outside our dusty windows right now, and we connect with the reality of being in a volcanic, um, being in the path of volcanic ash, being in a region which is, um, has geothermal potential, but also volcanic um, eruptions from time to time. And I think in, in a moment like this, we can't let the moment pass without reflecting <laughs> on... See you again soon. Oh, I care. And somebody you just got on me to hold you and hug you and make you laugh. And <laughs> I think Cheryl... <laughs> Cheryl, I think you're on me to... Yeah, sorry. Yes, this is a mo this is this is normal for people who lecture online. So I don't feel like it's a crisis whatsoever when somebody accidentally unmutes. That's fine. We roll with it. But I was saying, in a moment when we we're all seeing ashes outside our windows, we have to reflect. We can't let this opportunity to learn and reflect pass us. And as we continue these conversations around renewable energy and the energy transition in our region, may we have the wisdom to, to do this thing right and to do it in a way that's sustainable for our region and our conditions. Okay. All right, so to, to, on to my talk. Um, so I'm speaking today with you about sargassum seaweed. I just want to hide the meat and controls again because I hit them before, but I um, needed to see who was unmuted. Okay, sargassum seaweed, a source of transportation fuel for Barbados, maybe. And we are in a moment of um, investigating this very real possibility. So today I'll give you a little primer, a very short primer, not uh, um, scary primer, just enough for you to stay with me for the for the um, 15 slides. But a, a primer on biomethane in this whole question of renewable energy. Um, and then I'll talk about why not sugarcane, which is, um, sugarcane is a very obvious answer for, for a few reasons, but why we, we decided not to go there for biomethane. Why sargassum specifically? Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the tests that we've done and, and our ongoing research. Then I'll frame everything in, in the spirit of sustainability and how we um, propose to stay um, sustainable with this kind of solution. And then we'll do a final reflection and open up for feedback. All right, so biomethane primer. Um, so biomethane can cheaply and easily power a CNG converted ICE vehicle. I mean, I said ICE, I meant any internal combustion engine vehicle. Likely most of you logged into this webinar now have a regular internal combustion engine car parked in your garage, parked outside. And um, for those of us who probably no, I have, have an electric vehicle parked outside. The, the car you had before that was probably an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, so primarily in our region, we have these ICE vehicles and um, our big challenge, uh, particularly for Barbados, is that Barbados has a, re a goal to be 100% fossil fuel free by the year 2030. And so the question is, what will happen with the transportation sector of Barbados? And my primer, I'm, just, I'm showing you a picture here off Wikimedia, Wikimedia Commons, 
which shows a regular fiat tetrafuel um, CNG car, which has um, methane uh, compressed um, natural gas tanks in the car trunk. And pretty much if you convert any regular internal combustion engine car to a CNG um, drive train, you're gonna lose some trunk space for your tanks, and but you're just gonna drive as normal with the CNG converted car. Um, biomethane can actually replace the compressed natural gas in these tanks and it will be a purer form of natural gas because it will be actually um, mostly methane. So um, this solution we are proposing, biomethane, can be driven right away in CNG cars. Um, the, the good thing about that is we've proven and tested the CNG technology in Trinidad and Tobago in our region where CNG is available um, and the expertise around it is there. Um, okay. Anaerobic digestion for organic matter towards methane production is a multi-step process. The four steps are hydrolysis, acidogenesis, acetogenesis, and methanogenesis, finally, where methane is produced. Um, and basically, you have your digested or some kind of solid material and it's present in a slurry or watery solution. So anaerobic digestion takes a lot of water, it's a water intensive process. And so we speak in this talk about solutions involving the solid um, digestate, but also where we get the water from in, in water scarce Barbados. Okay. But first, let's talk about sugarcane, because when you speak about biofuel and cars, the first thing people think about is Brazil. And the first thing you think about is methanol from sugarcane in Brazil. And so the first question we asked, I actually set out on this project with five undergrads in summer 2019. And we were looking first at sugarcane as the solution. And then we came to a conclusion after some investigating. Why not sugarcane? Um, so the sugarcane industry in Barbados, as you can see from this data from the Barbados Statistical Service, you're seeing since 2007 a decline. But actually, when you look really look back in the literature, you see seven decades of decline in the sugar industry in Barbados. Since 1950, the industry has had a general a general downward decline. Here we look at the one one decade of data comparing the Barbados sugarcane industry to um, the Brazilian sugarcane industry. Um, and so this is sugarcane produced in Barbados, scaled by production in the year 2007. And as you can see that downward trend. Okay, so we thought first to repurpose the sugar industry for energy and then by the third week of our investigation, and these were the students who worked with me, by the third week of the investigation, we said, okay, not sugar cane. So that's Mr. Joshua Austin, Ms. Kristen Lynch, Ms. Carol Pivot, Ms. Aria Goodridge, and Ms. Brittany McKenzie, and that's me. And we were not wearing face masks because this is 2019, when all of us were still smiling and still happy and not wearing face masks. All right, continuing our discussion on sugarcane. Why not sugarcane? One of the things that um, Carol Pivot did on that team was she looked at production, sugarcane production in Barbados in the year 2017 and said, okay, let's just say we decided in the year 2017, take all the sugar produced in Barbados and use it for transport fuel. And with a quick calculation, Carol was able to calculate that based on the the, um, the driving um, routes in Barbados and based on the um, the tonnage of sugarcane out of that industry, um, that industry would have only fueled six percent of the required transportation fuel that was needed in 2018. Okay, so the 2017 product could only um, give us 6% of what was needed in the next year. So that is very small, and that would be for the entire sugar product of Barbados that year. So again, the numbers really convinced us that sugarcane is not the, the one solution for biofuel 
in uh, fossil fuel free Barbados. So why sargassum? Well, actually, so I, uh, since we're talking about these students and stories, this is Brittany and Brittany won me burst into my office that same summer 2019 when all of us were still in our offices. She came and knocked on my door and she said, I was on the van heading home and I drove past, um, I'm driving past the south coast and see and the mounds of sargassum and people working on it. And I thought, why not sargassum? Can we please look at this? And this is around the same time we kind of hanging up our hats about sugar cane. So I thought, why not? Um, let's look into sargassum and see what we find. All right. So these two images are from recent publications. Brooks 2018 shows a map of one year of the sargassum biomass aggregates in the Atlantic. And then one 2019 showing sargassum distribution in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. All right. And as you can see, the sargassum, well, as both of these authors project, the sargassum is here. It is here to stay and is expected to continue to increase. Um, one of the trends we really do see is that it comes across the Atlantic from the coast of West Africa, but as it hits um, the, uh, south of no the northern part of the South American continent, the runoff from the big rivers in South America really does fuel um, nutrients into the ocean. And then, so you have this blow up in the volume. So it starts at not so much leaving West Africa, but once it gets to our hemisphere, it the bloom expands because the nutrient rich waters come in off, run off from South America. And so we get this stable flux of sargassum seaweed into our islands and on our beaches. Sargassum seaweed delivers more biomass than these islands will ever produce, um, put together. However, it also wreaks havoc on the primarily tourism-based economies of the islands. So, um, so here I have featured this, this picture of um, Speyside Beach in Tobago. And then this is a picture I pulled off um, from Nation News Barbados. And that's a picture from the north coast of Barbados. Uh, and then this is a map from the NASA Earth, a satellite image from NASA Earth Observatory. And we, we've seen the sargassum on our beaches, most of us Caribbean nationals, and we smell the rotten sargassum and you know that is a problem on the beach. You, in fact, in Barbados, I could drive for, for 10 minutes. In fact, the nearest beach from me right now is a two minute drive away. Um, let's say the average person drives five minutes to a beach. If there's sargassum, you could go home. In Trinidad, you spend half the day driving to the beach. And to get to the beach and see this is very frustrating in Trinidad, which has happened to me. Um, and, uh, but beyond just the funny anecdotes, the fact is that tourism on the beaches is being affected. Okay, so we look at this, sar this um, biomethane solution where we say, imagine a, a sargassum seaweed feedstock Imagine a water source that's also local to our islands. And the water source we proposed in this research has been rum distillery wastewater primarily so far. So we've, that same team of students, we visited Foursquare Rum Distillery that summer. We also visited Mouth Gay Rum Distillery. And we were able, uh, Brittany on the team, let, um, assisted and guided by Dr. Nikolai Holder, who's in, um, in the chemistry department at UE Cape Hill, and he's our big guru on bio, um, biofuel and biomethane anaerobic digestion. We um, work together to, to, to use some of Dr. Um, Holder's micro digesters and look at the biomethane potential of the sargassum seaweed in the rum distillery wastewater. Um, investigating it as a source of biomethane for the transport um, transportation fuel in Barbados. So just the pictures, um, that's Mount Gay Ram Distillery. And these were samples we saw in Mount Gay. This is in the lab at um, in the chemistry department with Dr. Holder. Um, so that's Brittany's experiments from summer 2019. And this is just uh, 
biomethane kind of setup that Dr. Holder has outside of his lab actually powers the lab. All the Bunsen burners in the lab run on biomethane from grass cuttings on campus. Okay, so what did our biomethane potential test show? Because we needed that number. We needed to know how much biomethane can you get from sargassum? And so this is um, UWE Cave Hill faculty of science and technology grad student, Shamika Spencer. She, she, th at this time she was doing her MSc um, work under me. And this is her preparing samples for biomethane potential tests in, in micro digesters she built, but using um, Dr. Holder's design for micro um, digesters. All right, and the beauty of his design is that you could run many tests um, simultaneously right on your lab bench um, and get nice um, results about the biomethane potential of sargassum seaweed and the different rum distillery wastes. So how am I, well, so, so I, I'll talk first about the results from summer 2019 and jump a little bit into um, Ms. Spencer's results. So we harvested sargassum seaweed on the local beaches. Um, okay, I'm getting some noise from another unmuted mic, which I'll quickly identify who. Um, sorry. Okay, yeah, I think that noise went away. Yeah, it's easy to accidentally unmute a mic. I know. All right, so we harvested sargassum seaweed on the local beaches. We placed 35 gram samples in approximately 60 microanaerobic digester reactors and tested the impact of different tr treatments. So some of these sargassum were salt water pre-treated, so washed with salt water. You could think of the obvious reason why. Um, some of it was washed with fresh water. We used effluent from Dr. Holder's lab, and basically, which was um, fish offals and, and grass that he used as a bacterial source. Um, and then we had rum distillery waste fluids, and that summer we, we got um, waste fluid from Mount Gay and Foursquare. So these are the controlled experiments, and these were the actual samples that we looked at in terms of biomethane potential. Uh, and the results were pretty good. So what we found was that if we compare the output um, in terms of normal milliliters of biomethane per gram of fresh matter coming out of our samples, compared to the grasses, the local grasses that are being um, presented as potential biofuel crops, sargassum outperformed them by day, um, by day 11 of our tests. Okay, so good results from um, biomethane from sargassum with the different rum distillery waste around Barbados. Note though that rum distillery waste is known as a very good um, wastewater for anaerobic digestion. Other industrial waste will need to be similarly tested. The volume of the rum distillery waste only in Barbados we've calculated does not provide enough water for um, fueling the whole transport sector. So we'll actually have to expand beyond just run distillery waste if we went national with this solution. Okay, and then these are later results comparing four rum distilleries. So we went to Foursquare, West Indies rum distillery, Monkey, and St. Nicholas Abbey, and looked at their distillery waste and the kind of methane coming out of it in conjunction with sargassum seaweed. So what's going for, what are we doing going forward in the lab? Um, so we've recently bought four large home biogas systems for anaerobic digestion. We are going to be using these biogas systems um, at, the, at different rum distillery locations and um, uh, locations around Barbados um, and trying to figure out on a larger scale. So on a sort of um, 5,000 liter type of scale, um, the, the biomethane out of the samples. Um, we, we plan to gather six months of data um, for biomethane production and then looking at the processes around output and storage at each pilot anaerobic digester 
and then use that to help what are now our present ongoing projections for large scale kind of um, nationwide transport sector scale um, questions we're asking. Then we are going to also um, be testing CNG converted cars with the biomethane that we produce. So we, from each car, we want to produce six months of dry cycle data measuring the performance of each CNG um, car driven on our purified and compressed biofuel lo on local roads in Barbados. So that's some exciting work that's um, in the pipeline right now um, with our present um, graduate student and potential future grad student. So this kind of overview of what the experiment should look like going forward. Um, one second. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have our sargassum seaweed harvested in pirog scale vessels. That's my hope. And I'll speak to that a little bit on the next slide. Then we're gonna pre-treat the sargassum, dump that in our anaerobic digester systems. Then we're gonna have to scrub out the biogas to get the biomethane, um, compress the biogas and test it on our CNG vehicle. All right, so the principles that we want to run this experiment on, and this basically is, is like a pilot, um, uh, sus principles of sustainability. So this capture is actually from the students harvesting the sargassum, and they're on feet, they're using their own hands, they're collecting it in bottles and bags, and making sure to be careful and look at who are the little critters living in the sargassum? Who do we not want to harm? Who do we have to think about when we think about scaling up this solution? Um, so our solution touches on almost all the 17 UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, but we specifically target um, these five of the goals in our um, in the way we, we do our work. So first one is obviously affordable and clean energy. Right now, Caribbean countries pay the highest cost per kilowatt hour um, for energy because Small islands import in large amounts of fuel. Um, the economics plays out such that you pay more than anybody else pays. Um, climate action. So we are supporting the government of Barbados and her goal to move towards fossil fuel free by 2030. Um, because of climate, um, because of climate change and because of our desire to reverse climate change and to remove the effects of climate change on places like Barbados. Um, so moving away from um, anthropogenic carbon um, being introduced into our biosphere now. SDG number 14, life below water. So we do not in any way want our solution to harm the biology that's out there now. So we, we, um, we are actively researching responsible harvesting practices also for sargassum. Also, this recent increased bloom of sargassum has been shown in the literature to have an impact on the baby turtles who are um, going back out to sea. The sargassum has impacted fish, is impacting the coral reefs. So to present a solution where we could reduce the amount of sargassum that's out there or even eliminate it in our waters is um, part of the spirit of protecting and respecting life below water. SDG number 15 speaks about life on land and how is this connected to life on land? Well, the use of sargassum instead of some kind of agriculturally generated energy crop allows freed up land space to um, otherwise be purposed in towards the benefits say of land-based ecosystems. Um, so maybe a sargassum solution will prevent deforestation in some parts of the Caribbean, for example. But we do know that going to the ocean for a solution versus agricultural crops on land is in a way sustainability if it is done well. Um, and then SDG 17 partnerships. 
we, I mean, constantly I showed maps of our whole region. The whole region is suffering under the sargassum influx. And so regional partnership around this energy solution is one of our big goals. And we've been speaking to people in other parts of the region. Um, and the solution can be regionally applied. Rum distillery waste is something that as in many of our islands is, up, is intricate and interwoven into our history. Um, and of course, yes, several of our countries battle with the increased influx of sargassum. So um, that's it for all. This is the, the overriding um, philosophy underlying all our work and our approaches to the different parts of this project. And we'd be happy for feedback on that. And then um, for this work to happen, there's a lot of people who've contributed um, so that we want to thank, we want to thank Blue Chip Foundation, who's our primary sponsor right now in, in all of these experiments and things we, we, um, we're doing in the immediate future. Um, we also want to thank the rum distilleries and the four, for the larger rum distilleries in Barbados, that'll be Mount Gay, Four Square, West Indies and St. Nicholas, because they provided, um, rum distillery waste to us and have been open, um, saying, yes, we would like to be part of this solution. Um, I want to thank my students, Brittany McKenzie. Brittany was the one who said, let's test sargassum. Um, Aria, who said, what about methane by methane, CNG, because that's low hanging fruit for the Caribbean region. Um, Carol was the student who pointed out the fact that um, sugarcane was not, probably not the solution. Joshua Austin helped us to calculate the numbers in terms of what are the emissions reductions if we were to switch from primarily fossil fuel um, transportation to primarily biofuel transportation. Um, Kristen Lynch was a student who helped us to look at the different kinds of natural disasters in, in the Caribbean and look at the different modes of renewable energy and kind of verify that biofuel is a resilience tool. It, it, it is a type of um, fuel, but this biofuel solution is one that can help us in terms of resilience in our region, given our regional natural disasters. And I, I'll just give a little anecdote when I finish thanking these students, but Shamika Spencer, who did our second set of biomethane potential tests, she, she executed the tests and that those were the results we saw. Ms. Felicia Cox at BNOC, who every time I speak to Felicia, creative research ideas drop into the, the conversation. She's just a great resource to this work. And Felicia was the first person who had me thinking of rum distillery waste as the source of water in our Barbados where um, water is scarce. Uh, Dr. Nikolai Holder, who is our biomethane guy, we go to him with questions. Dr. Renique Murray, who is in um, UE St. Augustine campus, I am the mechanical engineering department. He actually gave us a couple lectures on the chemical engineering and the chemistry of fuel, um, the carbon and the hydrogen and all of these long chains. And he kind of, because I'm a mechanical engineer and my students, there were no chemical engineers among the students that, that um, summer. Dr. Marie is a biofuel expert and he sat with us and patiently explained everything and we got it. And then I want to thank the IDB who funded that first summer um, 2019, having those students work with me in the lab, their stipends were funded by the IDB and we want to thank them for that. Okay, and now back to this uh, map. So we're seeing dust. Um, ashes all over the atmosphere in Barbados. And I know I'm not the only person who had cold showers for three days in the past seven days because your solar water heaters on the roof didn't come through when there was no sunlight hitting Barbados for three days. If it felt like three days of darkness, maybe it was less than that, but I think it, if there were about three days where you looked outside and it, it was like, the middle of the night during the day. And definitely I had no hot water. And so I thought about the Barbados national energy policy. I thought about if half of this country were fueled by solar panels and we had dust influx, what would happen to base load and questions like that. And so 
again, I use the, the moment as a difficult moment for many of us to reflect and to think about well, what are we working on? What are we working towards? And how can we move forward with wisdom as a region as we move towards renewable energy for our Caribbean region? Okay. And with that, I want to thank everybody and I want to open this up for feedback and for questions. So I'll hand back over to you, Sherry Ann. Thank you very much, Legina. Very insightful. Um, I particularly like the diversification that's being highlighted in terms of the energy mix and that this research promises to contribute in such a way that's using a feedstock that's otherwise a nuisance, particularly for tourism and for those of us who use the beaches for recreation. And now I want to get some feedback. So just reminding colleagues um, to raise your hands uh, and you will be acknowledged um, to share or you may type your comments or questions in the chat. Uh, but to kick us off, I'm going to invite Dr. Sanjay Bahadur Singh from UWI St. Augustine to share with us. I know you are an e-mobility champion, so I want to hear your thoughts on this alternative to diversifying the transportation sector. Thank you, sherri -Ann. And let me um, congratulate Dr. Henry and her team on the initiative, um, job well done. Uh, it's always good to learn of these innovative measures and I strongly encourage you all to continue on that part. I only have a few minutes, so let me just jump straight into it and say that there are many green positives that we can you know, safely identify. And we always need to be conscious of how we can apply this application and how we can ensure that this actually translates into sustainability. And some thoughts that immediately come to mind, and I'm sure Dr. Henry and her team are probably looking at this and will not have had the time to address some of these concerns here, or issues I should say would be that, can it be sustainably scaled economically so that what we can have is a real revolution with that biogas source that can perhaps complement the electric vehicle revolution. And then of course, there are other there are other sidebar questions and sidebar points that we need to address, which is our feedstock. Um, Dr. Henry mentioned that it comes from the West Coast of Africa. So is it that we need to be looking at production at some point in time? How do we ensure that we have that volume of feedstock that we need to ensure the sustainability, the fuel efficiencies, specific energy relative to other forms of um, energy outside there that we may be harnessing for different modes of transportation. And then of course, the production side of things we will have to be looking at in terms of the volumes required to ensure the sustainability. So there's so many positives that come out of it. I'm looking forward to learning more about it. Let me congratulate Dr. Henry and her team again. And I'm sure some of the questions that come up will help us all benefit from that discussion. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, Lejana, any initial responses? Yes, um, let me just jump in and say, um, I like that Dr. That Sanjay brought up the um, the e-revolution, e-mobility, um, the rise of e-mobility. And we recently actually completed our e-mobility rollout plan with the IDB for Barbados, looking at, um, we actually, I mean, for my study with these students on the sargassum, we did very, um, basic calculations about transportation routes and, and needs in Barbados and the energy requirement. But recently for the for this um, e-mobility strategy, we actually use Google Maps and use Google data and um, OpenStreetMap and other sort of open sources of data to calculate routes, driving routes in Barbados and real energy demands. And looking at the numbers, you can't go much past 20% electrification for the um, transportation sector in Barbados. So which means 80% um, in a realistic scenario of a 2030, 2050 in Barbados. 80% of the cars still have to be driven fossil fuel free. So if, if you have 20% electric vehicles, what happens with the other 80% if you want to go um, fossil fuel free and so uh, biomethane and compressed natural, compressed biogas would be a uh, low-hanging fruit type of solution. Okay, thank you so very much for that. Um, and then for, we're going to turn now to Gerald Lindo, sustainable energy expert with the Secret, to hear his initial thoughts on the presentation. Sure. 
Thanks, Sherry. And um, I'm joined by my son right now. So if you hear any delighted squealing, um, he enjoyed That's the presentation okay. as well. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo, <laughs> I want to echo a lot of what Sanjay said. Um, I think it's, it's great, um, just in principle, to see local scientists tackling local solutions because I'm not sure anybody is going to solve these kind of problems for us. So it's great to see um, this kind of work being done. Um, it's it's so multifaceted, right? It, it touches on, on on ecology. It touches on our, our waste management problems. It touches on the transportation problem. So you're killing several birds with one stone, so to speak. So we love that. Um, a, a couple of things uh, pop to mind. Um, like Sanjay, the issue of how this scales economically is it, going to be a big one. So I'm, I'm glad to see that you're stepping in that direction with some of these, these pilot facilities that you're going to be working on over the summer, I believe you said. Um, I'm mm -hmm. curious as to how much biomethane could be reliably produced as well. And, and I say reliably because uh, you, the, I'm, I'm not sure how frequently the, the sargassum appears on, on, on the shores and what the logistics of getting it from shore to process of processing facility looks like. Mm -hmm. um, one other question that, that, that I had from the presentation, there was a graph that showed um, um, the sort of production you got from, from different distillery effluent, if I, if I recall correctly. And I recall it being very different. And I was wondering if you knew a bit about what was driving that difference. Is there such a big difference in composition between them? Um, finally, finally, uh, I, I was wondering what happens after the digestion. I presume there's some residue that's, that's left over in the bad digest, and I'm wondering if it's useful for anything as well, perhaps as a fertilizer. Because again, this particular solution could potentially kill many birds with one stone. I'm very glad as well um, that you are, are, are very cognizant that the e-mobility revolution is a wonderful thing, that's the way things are going. But we are, there will be some point where we have to kind of bridge a gap, right? There will be a lot of ICE vehicles that are going to still be operating for a very long time. And so we need to find a solution for them in the medium term um, while we electrify. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot. It made me and my son squeal in delight. Uh, we look forward to more results coming out of your group. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Noah, for joining the conversation. Uh, so, Lejena, I, I noted about three questions. So. Yeah, sure. So, I, I wrote them down. So, one of the things he asked was numbers. Oh, no, reliability of the sargassum. Are we sure is here to stay? And, like, I, I referred in the presentation to two journal papers that were written recently, and more have, have been published since then. But, yes, we have a reliable source of sargassum, and it actually promises to get worse. And so, of course, in my lab, we think of it as it promises to get better because we'll see more and more bio, um, bio feedstock for our anaerobic digesters. Um, for the tourism people, they call it worse and it is a crisis for tourism. And, and so we want to turn around that crisis. So yes, this is a reliable um, bio feedstock in the, in the foreseeable future in our region. And it, it is a problem we have to tackle in a way that is, Jared um, actually spoke about, he asked what happens to what's left over. And so it reminded me of a term we've used in, in working with the IDB on our, we have a working paper that will soon be um, published on this solution. And one of the terms that they like to use over there is circular economy in that this solution tackles very many different things and this solution is one that will drive itself by the, the um, entrepreneurial kind of economic stimulation that um, is pushing. It's pushing economic stimulation and the, um, the so, so that it will keep driving itself kind of thing. It's not going to be like always clean enough. So, so what's happening now is you have to always go and clean up the beach in response to a big influx. And that's just depleting the economy versus an economic solution that continues to feed itself. Um, so yes, Jared, the, left, the leftover stuff, the sludge from these anaerobic digesters is great for um, agriculture and for fertilizer. And that is that's, um, something that 
will be the uh, probably topic of some of our further investigations as we get more support and funding and more students involved in, in the research and as we expand beyond the lab. Um, one more thing I'll say is he asked about, well, how much of that sum can we get? And he asked about, can this be scalable in an economic sense? And even um, Dr. S um, Sanjay, um, he, Sanjay also asked, can it be scaled up in an economic way? And, and so I actually had my students, I teach this class called ENSE 2003, um, Sustainable Energy Systems. And this, this semester, their end the term project was I gave them the numbers we had in the lab. I gave them statistics about Barbados and about different feedstocks and the distillery waste. And they were gonna design the biogas plant that would um, fuel the, the, the transportation sector in Barbados. So yes, the question is we need, we, um, we, we can come up with the number and we kind of have come up with some numbers about how much sargassum you need. And when I look at the literature and I look at what's being published about how much influx we get, the answer is there's enough sargassum. The answer is we might have to look around for the industrial waste beyond the rum distillery waste, but there's still a lot of potential here in Barbados and in the wider Caribbean for this solution. So yeah, that's, those are the three questions. Okay, um, I think there was another one uh, in terms of the difference in the rum distillery um, effluent, that there may have been some differences in the graphs in terms of the what was produced. Oh, yes. So, yeah, um, and we learned a lot about rum in this process. We, we went in there innocent. You saw the, the five of us, the six of us. Nothing. We knew nothing about rum and we learned a whole lot. So, one of the things is how rum distilleries process um, their product. And so we realized um, bigger, well, I don't wanna say too much about the rum distillery process, although I don't think anybody told us anything proprietary, but the rum distillery process differs from plant to plant based on the kind of rum they produce and also based on the volume produced. So Malgay Distillery, we saw uh, two parts of Malgay Distillery. We saw where they made their premium rums in a small scale setting. And then we saw where they made the, the larger volume rums. And it's two different kinds of distillery waste produced. In the large scale volume, you can actually keep reusing the wastewater. And so by reusing the wastewater, you take out some of that biological matter from it. And so we got low numbers from the first set of um, this wastewater from Mount Gay in the summer 2019 test. We got better stuff out of it in the 2020 test. And that was because they knew what we were doing and they gave us, I think, wastewater from the premium side of things. So different, uh, yeah, right? So uh, depending on the kind of rum you're making and the configurations at your distillery, um, there'll be different amounts of expected biomatter in the wastewater. And that would result in different amounts of methane out. And so we, we did a detailed study on that in 2020. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, different different kinds of wastewater and what 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 comes out of it. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So we have a few questions coming in from our other participants. Uh, so uh, is it John Millage or Millage John? I'm not sure which one should come first. Um, your hand is up. So we're gonna invite you to unmute and ask your question. Good afternoon. I'm speaking from the UK. So, uh, yeah, a very interesting presentation. We've been working on the AD of seaweeds for some considerable time at the University uh -huh. of Greenwich. And uh, sargassum is quite a recalcitrant material. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. When you try to digest it on its own, uh, it has a number of uh, recalcitrant, um, fibrous um, carbohydrates, uh, polysaccharides, and it's also chock full of uh, very interesting phenolics, which tend to inhibit um, anaerobic digestion. We have found that uh, there's a synergism uh, and you can increase, as you found, um, by co-digesting sargassum with other materials. Um, so that that's very interesting. The 
there was a question earlier that said, what do you do with the waste, with the digestate? And one of the concerns that we have is that we found very high levels of, sarg of arsenic in sargassum. And what we haven't as yet done and we're hoping to do is to track that arsenic through a digester. Because if it's turning up in the digestate, uh, then it's going to be very problematic in its use. And um, digestate use is key to efficient anaerobic digestion. But I look forward to all these results being published um, so that we can study them in more detail. Um, but uh, it appears an excellent piece of work. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would All like right. to ask John, though, where, where did they um, harvest their sargasson? <laughs> Yeah, we, we've been, um, we've got an association with the School for Fields in South Caicos, uh, and we've currently got a study funded by Darwin Plus uh, on South Caicos. Okay. Um, one of the problems that I think that uh, when uh, overseas organisations were uh, collaborating on this was trying to get usable material to study. And I know that the first materials came back in quite a poor state. So what we did is that in the first study is that we got um, an export permit and, and scientific permits, permit from Turks and Caicos government. And we okay. were able to input very fresh material in under 48 hours. They were in our lab and we were carrying out the tests. What okay. we did along. What we did alongside that was we also uh, studied some freeze dried material okay. and what we found was that the freeze drying process had no effect on the sargassum in terms of methane potential and its, and its major chemical composition. So now we're getting regular samples uh, from Turks and Caicos uh, in freeze dried form which makes it very much more convenient to use so uh we've just, we 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 we've um with the, the school fields put a, a freeze dryer on there and what we're also doing is studying the change in the chemical composition as the material decays on the beach because very often material is not collected fresh but um, right. okay. subsequently and, and and so we're concerned that there are significant changes there, but that work is in a very early stage. Uh -huh. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Charles Griffith, um, I saw your hand up. You go ahead and unmute. All right. You're not, yes, unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. My concern is um, primarily the changes in the product over time, from the time it leaves the water and sits on the beach. And I think that last speaker, uh, looking at that, the other thing is that, is there a plan to arrest the star, uh, sargassum at least a mile before it reaches the beach. So you would not have sargassum on the beach. In other words, are you thinking about a system whereby you can harvest it before you reach the beach so tourism would not be interrupted? So those were my two comments and I await uh, any answers from anyone. I think it's an excellent project and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to respond to the question about deep water harvesting. Um, we are, everything, everything we've looked at so far is concerns harvesting it before it beaches because a, yeah. a lot of the concerns are what happens on the beach and the tourism factor and everything else. So yeah, the, yes. our, our plan is, is deep water harvesting of, of the sargassum it, within the exclusive economic zone of the relevant territory. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm uh, gonna read a few questions in the chat, Nijeno. Um, 
from Crispin Andrews. Uh, he's commending excellent presentation. Uh, he's, if he's not mistaken, um, from the graph that shows the yield from the sargassum with seawater wash was higher than the wash with fresh water. However, in the process flow, the fresh water was used. Uh, any reason why? Well, yeah, the, so, so just when we use fresh water, salt inhibited the, um, the, the process, but the question that we'll un answer going forward is how much, and everything is an economic question. So ideally, salt water treatment is probably better in a water scarce environment like Barbados. Um, we don't wanna have water intensive processes that take water away from other uses on island. However, we need to understand what the, the difference is even in terms of energy out and financials. If you use salt water to process it versus using fresh water. And so that decision is an economic decision and a sustainability decision. Um, but yes, we, we did see a marked difference between the fresh water treatment, which was higher um, compared to salt water treatment of the fresh sargassum. Okay. All right, and uh, we'll take the next question from Daniel Evanson. Has he on it? Oh, you unmuted and muted again. Good afternoon. Hi, hi, uh, Dr. Henry. Um, hi. Right, hi. right. Sexting project. I agree. Um, uh, my questions are. Pretty, pretty basic and I'm not sure if, if it's that I missed it or you didn't um, say specifically. Um, you had mentioned that um, that it wouldn't be able to, to power the entire transport sector. Did, did you mention how, what percentage it might be able to replace in terms of in terms of fossil fuels and the quantity of emissions reductions? that we would see from that and um have you explored yet or is that in the in the phase to come the conversion efficiency of um the the fuel when it's when it's in use and one point to touch on in response to john i think it was in terms of the heavy metals um there is actually a company regionally that uses the sargassum and they have a process that takes all the heavy metals, but that's proprietary, and I don't know how you would kind of, you know, yeah. make use of that's, that. Um, but they do do that. Okay, cool. Well, it's good to hear that. I um, so when you said proprietary, we actually in the middle of um reviewing a paper with the IDB and actually um some other work re related to this. So we do have numbers. You asked about the numbers in terms of the carbon emissions and numbers in terms of, um, there was another number you asked. So very soon this, this work in paper with the IDB will be published and I'll have it passed through the same network that got word of this talk. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll share it on LinkedIn and Instagram and wherever. Um, but that's not published as yet. But yes, there's a massive um, carbon emissions reduction in moving from the fossil fuel process to this kind of process in a sustainable way. Number one, the next question you asked was about what percentage of transportation fuel. So we are actually looking at, we started off saying, let's just, trans, let's just power the whole transport sector in Barbados. How many cars, how much emissions, how much gasoline, how much diesel. And we, we did detailed calculations of that. And with the um, hope, and I actually have worked within the EV um, question and also this question and have looked at if the national grid in Barbados upgraded could only support 20% of the transportation sector um, being electrified, then can Sargassum solve the other 80% of the transportation sector? Looking at car routes, looking at driving routes from school to work, from work to home, and, and all of that, those kinds of numbers. And so that's what we're feverishly going towards, um, Danielle. We are actually trying to answer the question, this is how much Sargassum you need to, um, harvest in a year. This is how much industrial fluid waste you need. 
to see, to um to, to gather up and, and and to channel towards your process. This is how much. This is how much is. So we actually are working on the numbers using these kind of pilot um, projects and. And the hope is, and in fact, I said in my last slide that we actually want by the end of the year to have driven um, f driven on the biomethane we're producing, compressed and, and, and drive um, some local CNG cars on that. And the point of that is to take drive cycle data and, and put harder numbers on the question of can it can it drive the fleet, can it power the fleet, the national fleet in Barbados? So, yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Regina. Um, there's a few more questions um, and then we're gonna be wrapping up because we are out of time. Uh, Safar has two questions. She's curious is if there's any potential for the ash, the volcanic ash that we're now experiencing to affect sargassum blooms um, potentially as nutrients. And her second question um, is, although the research is early stages, what is the ownership model envisioned if the fuel takes off? Public-private sector partnership, um, partnership with existing fuel companies. Um, have you thought about that part of it? Yeah, and those, again, so she asked two things. Um, I thought about that. I was like, oh shoot, look at all this volcanic ash. What's going to happen to the sargassum? But you know what? So yeah, we have the same thoughts. Who, who asked that question? That was um, Safari Vital, one of our <laughs> interns with this decree. Okay, good. So she was asking a question I was wondering about too in the past seven days. But, um, and I imagine, so everybody's saying the farmers will get a bumper crop this year. And I even look outside, I find my grass looks greener in my yard right now. But that's probably just because I haven't been outside for a week. But I think, um, so, and, and this is one event, right? The, the volcanic ash, but it has been said that it does help bio life. It helps the, the plants. Um, so I imagine maybe it'll have an impact and maybe she'll do her PhD on that. But the next question is, um, what is the business model, the ownership model, and all of those kinds of questions are questions being um, navigated right now. So early, early to see. Okay, but, and the ownership model, okay. Yeah, Sim similar. Yeah. Okay, all right, uh, final question and then we have a couple of comments. Uh, did the various tests conducted for biogas production take into consideration dif different levels of degradation of the sargassum and how this may affect the, uh, may impact the bioconversion efficiency? And this is coming from Gian Hansen. Thank you, Gian. Um, the, the, all the sargassum we processed was freshly harvested from the north coast of Barbados. We had some students, some volunteers go out in the beach like Bijans like to do and collect sargassum. So it was all fully fresh when it went into the digesters and got all the pretreatment and that kind of stuff. So we worked with fresh and our aim is to work with fresh to, to harvest them straight out to the ocean and take them straight to the processing um, system. Okay. All right. Um, there is a, a YouTube link that's being shared um, in terms of carbon system for harvesting at sea. So that may be interesting to look at. Um, Hazel Oxenford is letting you know that CERMES has students looking at biodiversity associated with sargassum at various distances from shore to look at optimal harvest distance. Uh, right. So interesting collaboration there. Um, they're yeah. also working on a simple drone monitoring system to estimate the volume of sargassum stranding on beaches um, throughout um, the project is SARG ADAPT. Mm -hmm. uh, so some collaboration coming yes. with CERMI is possibly there. And finally, from Angelica Namdar, um, the Wageningen University and research did work about the potential of sargassum in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, those publications may be interesting. And in 2014, okay. uh, there's a professor in Suriname who also started some preliminary research. Uh, so that may be interesting to look. So we're seeing Great. potential points for collaboration and that's why we're here to network, yeah. to share our ideas and to, to build better together. Um, and so Legina, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I mean, I was, I was very happy to hear from fellow scientists looking at the sargassum. Um, the Dutch Caribbean, I'm wondering if the publications are available in English or if they're in Dutch. 
Um, uh, so I, I'll actually run um, some lit review and look at that. And I'm also happy to hear from Hazel Oxenford, Dr. Oxenford, at UE Cave Health and what's happening right here on the campus. And I'll also reach out there. So I'm just happy for the um, connections and happy for this moment to reflect on our Caribbean and our transition. Thank you so very much, Lejeune, for presenting today. Very well done, very interesting. And thank you to our participants for sharing, for asking your questions and for helping to make um, what I'm sure will be produced um, from the UEK Hill even better. Our next regional universities networking webinar will be Friday, May 14th. So you can mark your calendars and look out for the registration link. Our, our presenters um, will be from the University of Technology, Jamaica, led by Dr. Ruth Patopsing. And they will be sharing with us the Master of Science in Sustainable Energy and Climate Change, which is a program they piloted there. And they'll share select innovative research business ideas which have emerged from that program. So as you go, we encourage you play your part in alleviating the challenges posed by the ongoing volcanic activity on our Caribbean neighbors. And do enjoy a productive rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>